Good morning and welcome uh, to this second in a three-part uh, seminar series. Uh, my name is Tim Kawahara and I am the Executive Director of the UCLA Zyman Center for Real Estate. Uh, today's seminar is titled Climate Change, Health and the Built Environment, Adaptation and Community Resilience. Uh, this is a series intended to lead a multidisciplinary examination of the interconnectivity between climate change, human health and the built environment. The UCLA partners convening today's program include the Zyman Center's Housing is Healthcare Initiative, um, the Center for Healthy Climate Solutions, uh, and the Center for Impact at Anderson. Uh, and just one quick housekeeping item, uh, we will reserve time for questions at the end of the seminar, so uh, we encourage you to submit any questions you may have in the Q&A function. Um, for those of you that were unable to attend the first seminar, uh, the purpose was to set the landscape by examining the current climate threats in the state including wildfires, extreme heat, air quality, and sea level rise, and how these risks are mitigated or exacerbated by the built environment. We were fortunate to receive keynote remarks from the renowned Dr. Richard Jackson in the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Uh, through the lens of human health, Dr. Jackson discussed uh, greenhouse gas emissions, environmental standards, fossil fuel use, how the next generation is demanding change, and advocated for investment in climate and health. Um, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, we need to respond to this existential, existential threat with as much power, intellectual and financial, as the federal government gave to responding to threats during World War II. This is possibly more important than when we faced then. Uh, Dr. Jackson's keynote was followed by an informative panel discussion with an incredible group of speakers, uh, including Dr. Ryan Vaughn, technical product manager at a group called Jupiter Intelligence, uh, Dr. David Eisman, Professor of Medicine and Public Health, David Geffen School of Medicine, and UCLA Fielding School, uh, School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Laura Cushing, Assistant Professor, and Jonathan Karen Fielding, Presidential Chair in Health Equity, UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Um, and then finally, Dr. Elizabeth Rose, who, uh, Rhodes, who is the Director of Climate Change and Sustainability Program for the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Um, we, if you would like to review the, the first seminar itself, the first in the series, you can access it, uh, access the recording by going to the link, which I, prov I, I believe we're gonna uh, put in the chat right now for you. Um, it is now my great pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's program. Uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Cole is Assistant Professor of Environmental Health Sciences in the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. He pioneered the use of Health Impact Assessment or HIA in the US and led multidisciplinary teams to conduct HIAs on a vast array of po policies and projects, many in the transportation sector, including the West Side Subway Extension in Los Angeles, the California High Speed Rail Project, and proposed changes to California's uh, tax, uh, state gas tax. Um, his research is now applying HIA tools to examine health equity effects of local climate adaptation efforts. And with that, I would like to, to welcome my, my colleague, Brian Cole. Brian. Hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, so I'm going to make a, a few very brief comments, and then we can move on to our, our panelists. Uh, I'd like to set a frame, you know, for thinking about uh, this issue uh, and transition. You know, I'll say a little bit about the problem of climate change in the last webinar. That was the main focus, uh, but I'd like to pivot today to solutions. But first, we'll, we'll just briefly summarize the problem. Uh, can I have the first slide up uh, about, yes, uh, health effects of climate change? So just last week, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, their, their working group number two, so that's they have different working groups periodically. Uh, about every five years or so, they'll produce these massive reports about climate change, the scientific foundations of what are the drivers of climate change and what are the impacts. Last week, the impact report uh, number six was released. Uh, it's a long report. Uh, I think the synthesis portion of it is 3,500 pages. Uh, that's not including the technical appendices. Uh, but there is a, a wealth of information uh, in there detailing things like what I'm showing here on this chart, the health effects of climate change. If anything, um, 
compared to previous versions of that report, the situation is more dire than uh, we previously recognized. So the climate change, and, and we mean included in tri- climate change are higher average temperatures in some places, cooling more extreme temperatures overall, more extremes in precipitation, rising sea level, uh, sea levels and also changes in the level of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, which changes also the chemistry of the ocean. All of these have pretty serious implications for human health, uh, changing our exposures, like exposures to extreme heat events, ex- exposures to wildfire smoke, f- flooding, drought, disruption of our food supply, uh, increasing problems with water access and also the quality of our water supply, vectors um, spreading diseases like malaria, uh, dengue, uh, increased um, tick-borne fevers like Lyme disease, and literally changing the landscape around us. Uh, there's a, is even a new term called solastalgia, uh, this sense of loss of uh, a place that one used to feel connected to, but it is no longer the same place due to whether it's a wildfire, a flood, uh, other types of ecosystem changes in the natural environment, our built environment, everything is changing and all of this is going to be affecting human health. It is already affecting human health. So um, that's, that's the problem. Now let's talk about what can we do. Uh, let's not bury our heads in the sand. There's a lot we can do. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Oftentimes people will divide up climate action, and I'm going to group all of these different actions together uh, because I, I think some, sometimes we make uh, too much about the distinctions between mitigation, for instance, which means uh, reducing the levels of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. That's primarily by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but it could also include sequestration, locking up that carbon in plants, in the soils, in, in the ocean. And uh, then we have climate adaptation. So recognizing that climate change is already underway and we have to prepare uh, our infrastructure, our policies, our social systems to meet the challenges of climate change. And we have resiliency. Uh, That means building capacity. And I would say a lot of this has to be very local. It's not exclusively local, but largely local. a capacity to uh, recover and adapt to climate changes, emergencies, uh, whether these are the slowly unfolding variety like sea level rise or the sudden ones like wildfire. The changes that uh, we need involve our physical infrastructure, policies and programs. I, I love this photo here. Um, it's a solar panel, obviously, but the program is uh, taking uh, coal miners, this is in West Virginia, and retraining them to be solar, uh, solar installers. Uh, and just a, you know, emblematic of the type of transition that we need to make. And then changing our social systems uh, to be uh, responsive to, to these challenges. And I will pause it, and perhaps we'll have more time to talk about this later in in our discussion today, is I'll posit that uh, we need to rethink our social systems, our governance uh, to be more adaptive and and quickly responsive that um, old, there is a place for command and control top down, uh, but that by itself will not be sufficient. Uh, Next slide, please. The, Uh, Other thing, and we're talking about health today, uh, the thing to keep in mind is that the health effects of climate change are not distributed equally. Uh, In general, it's those populations 
not not where the temperatures are going to be increasing the most, but it's those populations that are most vulnerable, that are living on the edge, whether that's people living in areas of concentrated poverty in the United States, marginalized communities, or globally, uh, people who are living uh, subsistence farmers, uh, especially areas like sub-Saharan Africa, parts of the Andean region uh, of Latin America, particularly uh, going to be very hard hit uh, by the chain, by climate change. Now, uh, it's, it's not just because these populations are going to be hit hard by climate change, but they also are in the forefront of change, uh, of a, this a building, this adaptive capacity. There's an enormous amount of what I call local knowledge that we can tap into about what works, what doesn't, what's gonna be the bet, best fit for a climate uh, resilient solution in a particular community. And then also one thing I found in some of my own research interviewing sustainability managers around the United States is the value of a public health lens that, uh, you know, climate change, unfortunately, is still a controversial issue in some, some pockets, uh, even though we see it all, all around us. But public health is uh, an issue that it is easier, you know, COVID notwithstanding, it is actually easier to uh, get people mobilized around public health issues, especially at the community level, than around climate. Climate may have effects that are quite distal, uh, but public health tends to be more, more immediate. Uh, and many of the sustainability managers that I've been interviewing say, we, we want to work more with public health because we can get more stakeholders on board and those climate skeptic policymakers, uh, they, they will join us in implementing these climate actions uh, in a way that they would not if we were focusing exclusively in terms of you know, focusing on climate change alone. So this is our call to action. And I'm really interested to hear what our uh, panelists uh, have to, to say about this. Um, we have a, a huge amount of experience uh, today. Uh, we have uh, Sarah Neff, we have uh, from the, uh, she's the head of sustainability for Lend Lease Americas. Jonathan Parfrey, Executive Director of Climate Resolve, and Ben Stapleton, Executive Director of the U.S. Green Building Council, Los Angeles. So let's start off with, um, with Sarah. I'd like each of you uh, perhaps to, to say a little bit about what you find exciting uh, and in your work and uh, We'll, we'll get into a discussion of like, how do we raise up these uh, best practices, this innovation that's out there? Uh, so much is being done, how can we do more? So Sarah, um, thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Brian, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Am I sounding fine? Good, good, thank you guys. So, hi everybody, um, just throw up my slides whenever. Um, so uh, excited to so excited to be here. Um, I again, I'm Sarah Neff. I'm head of sustainability for Lend Lease Americas. We are an unusual company. So if you want to go to the next slide, we'll just take um, a second to talk about what it is that we do. So we're a global company. We are based in Sydney. Um, the Americas headquarters is in New York. Um, we're an old company, so we've been around 1958. Um, but we be a touch a variety of asset types. So I do a lot of um, military housing. We have 40,000 military homes across 18 communities. We're also pure construction. So um, <laughs> that means we're building between you know, 30 and 50 construction projects in all of the markets that you see um, in the Americas region uh, that are under my purview. And we also do straight uh, investment management and development. You know, we're raising funds with JB Partners. We're deploying that capital and, and building projects, including in Los Angeles. 
And then we have a large uh, sort of its own thing, 15 million square foot uh, development with Google. So I am running sustainability across all of that, um, which is which is crazy and exciting. And I, I enjoy it quite a bit. Um, next slide. And so here's what I'm excited about. Uh, before I joined Lendlease about eight months ago, uh, Lendlease set two really, really ambitious targets. One is that um, it said, yes, we are a 1.5 degree aligned company. Um, that was uh, created because our senior management um, looked at what they thought the world was like in a four degree, three degree, one and a half degree scenario and decided, yep, we want to be living in the one and a half degree scenario. That's what we want to be doing business in, in a long time from now. And so we set what are called our mission zero, which is what you, you see on this a slide, um, which is to be net zero carbon scopes one and two by 2025. So that's right around the corner. Got to get that done across all those businesses, but even more crazily, um, which I am really excited about. I have to get the whole company for America's to absolute zero, no offsets, every scope uh, by 2040. That includes our all of our tenants. That can concludes all of our construction material. That includes question mark. Nobody actually has done a scope three inventory in real estate in the globe, as far as I know. So we'll be spending the back half of this year actually determining what is in and what is out on scope three. So we know exactly what that means. It means we're going to have to be ripping out any gas, gas using equipment we have and replacing with all electric. I mean, there's a lot. We have to figure out zero carbon concrete and zero carbon steel and zero carbon cement mixers. And there's um, zero carbon forks. I mean, we got we to do it all. So um, there's a lot. I'm finding it really exciting. And then on the social piece, um, that is also really important to us. So we've also committed by 2025 to creating $250 million of social value. And a lot of that social value is this connection um, between um, public health and climate change. Um, how are we doing that? We're doing that through um, improving waterways for fresh drinking water. There are... Um, climate change impacts um, that uh, that are you know making um, certain areas hotter. And so we're working with Habitat Humanity on how do we you know retrofit those homes so that they're more formally comfortable. So there's a lot going on there that I'm excited about. So I want to talk a little bit about where we are on this journey. We don't just set goals. We actually want to know how we're going to meet them. So next slide. Um, so we started out here. Uh, around climate change. So this is what happened. This was this was before my arrival. And then you'll see Sarah second in a second. So we knew that we were going to have to figure out how to decarbonize from an investment standpoint. That means we'd have to pick joint venture partners um, and funds and those who finance our sustainability linked loans. Um, they're on board with all of everything we're doing in terms of decarbonizing. Um, we also know that everything has to be all electric. So from here on out, um, in investment management and development, these are going to be all electric buildings. This is tricky in places like Chicago and Boston with very cold winters and uh, not amazing uh, low temperature heat pumps available. Pretty hard to do it in Alaska military community right now, but we are working on it. Um, but yes, the, the the default is all electric. And if it, we have to do gas right now, what we're doing is like the gas, there is a boiler, but it only turns on if it's negative 10 or below. And theoretically, we've made the retrofit pretty easy. Um, so we're not just like, well, I give up, it's cold. So we'll just use gas all the time. Um, we have a commitment to be using 100% renewable electricity before 2030. Um, that is a, there's a variety of ways we're doing that. Happy to talk about it. Um, I think I'm going to sneeze, but I can't tell if I am. Am I? I don't think so. Okay. Um, and then we go three that we're going to have to work with our supply chain partners. We're doing that now um, uh, already through setting embodied carbon targets um, and needing to meet them. So we're working with our concrete suppliers and our steel suppliers. Um, that's very much happening in Los Angeles right now. Um, and then working with our tenants uh, who are going to have to transition to 100% renewables at some point. And so trying to bake that in now. So the, my last slide is going to talk about, and you don't have to read this whole thing on our website. Don't worry about it. But we actually have a, a roadmap. So this is what I created when I got here. I was tasked with, all right, we have these goals. We sort of know what the steps are, but how do we actually? Um, so each of those business units that I just discussed, construction, um, uh, military communities, investment management, development, and the thing with Google, all had to create their version of this roadmap, which then rolled up into a roadmap for the Americas region. And you can see basically when we think that we're going to be starting and done with stuff. Some stuff was was easy. We started it right away. That's green leasing program was a was an early win. We figured out how to get 
100% renewables for a lot of our assets through our utilities. We're already getting pretty good at um, doing a life cycle costing analysis, LCA analysis for, uh, for um, our construction projects to minimize it in that way. Certain things are going to take quite a bit longer. Um, you know, we, for example, the Google project is already sort of experimenting with zero emission refrigerants now, but I think it's going to kind of take um, military quite a bit longer to get there. Um, you know, the the retrofitting uh, gas uh, mixed fuel buildings to all electric is not commercially viable right now. And I, I, I see us starting that activity in 20. 2030, if not earlier. Um, we're seeing some alternative fuels now um, where we, we have 100% renewable diesel um, for uh, no projects at all, but we have a little bit of diesel for projects in California, but my Europe team can get 100% renewable diesel everywhere. So we have one of those, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. So I'm really excited to be sort of working um, on all of these uh, aspects of our business and driving, you know, my job is to drive us forward. Um, on all of all of these activities um, as we march towards our 2025, 2030, and 2040 targets. So I think I've kept myself under minutes and I will turn it back to Brian. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, you you actually, I think, have some time left, but uh, we'll devote it to Q&A. Yeah, uh, so uh, next we have Ben Stapleton uh, from the US Bean, uh, Green Building Council, uh, Los Angeles, Executive Director there. Ben, thank you. Thank you for, for having me today, uh, Brian, and the whole Zyman Center. Um, go Bruins. I'm a, I'm a Bruin, so I always appreciate being able to speak at, at these events. Um, and, you know, you asked kind of what I'm excited about. And, you know, really, you know, part of the reason I work in this space, I'm, I'm sort of a sustainability generalist, is that I love that through the built environment, we can really kind of bring everything together. It gives us something concrete that uh, really touches issues from energy to water, to waste, to mobility. Uh, and so I'm, I'm excited about our ability to, to really kind of bring awareness and start creating more impact. Uh, ne next slide, please. Um, and a little bit about who we are. So we're the US Green Building Council, Los Angeles. Uh, we're an independent nonprofit. So while we're affiliated on some level with the Green Building Council that runs uh, the LEED certification and credentialing we know and love, uh, our mission is different, really focused on leveraging the built environment as an entry point uh, to transform Southern California into a more sustainable region for all. Um, we've grown our, our programming uh, quite a bit over the past few years and really focused on direct community engagement and, and education uh, and really trying to be the, the uh, premier sort of sustainability focused membership uh, organization here in the Southern California uh, region. Next slide, please. And I want to talk for a moment just about kind of where we're at and the, the, the sort of humanity of what we're dealing with. You know, I think uh, when we look at, you know, where we're at when it comes to, to climate change right now, um, you know, we all kind of hear the doom and gloom. And, you, you know, you sort of look at uh, the degree temperature change range that we need to stay within. If you look at this graph here, it's kind of like, OK, you know, are we going to reach low emissions or very low emissions on the scale uh, that's going to be tough to do. The, the reality is we're probably going to be, you know, in this, this mid-level emission standpoint. And, you know, it's, it's, this is a very real thing. You talk to younger people these days, you talk to those who work in the space, a lot of people feel very overwhelmed and, and depressed when we kind of look at where we're at. I mean, emissions still went up last year, which is sort of a, a thing we have to, to think about on a day-to-day on -day basis. Uh, and we get sort of lost in this data. If you go to the next slide, um, and if it looks familiar to you, you know, I, I sort of think about what we've all been living through over the last couple of years and COVID and how we've been checking graphs and what is the case count this week versus last week. Uh, and, you know, I just want us to take a sort of step back. I think we get lost in this data and it starts to feel like, well, I can't really do anything. So I'm just going to, to, to sort of, you know, give up. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, I think it's, it's important to, to take a moment, think about, well, where are we? right now. And, you know, we really need to humanize our, our resistance and our engagement around climate change. You know, this struggle for progress is eternal as, as, a, as a human race, as a species. Um, you know, our generations before us are dealing with putting food on the table, having a, having a home, uh, you know, having a job. And, you know, humanity in so many ways is so much further ahead of where we've been. And so we need to think about this is our struggle of our generation. I and mean, we have other things we're going to struggle with, but this is, this is one of them is really this struggle in terms of fighting climate change and that we need to find joy in these small moments of triumph on the way, the, 
the people you meet, I've, you know, the, I've had the, the pleasure of working with Sarah and with Jonathan and, and we need to take joy out of those moments and those projects and those small wins and the happiness in, in those, in those friends and those relationships we form, because this is going to be a long-term struggle for, for us as a people. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so what does that mean? What do we really do with that? Well, we really need to accelerate the adoption of new technology. I think we're seeing that right now, especially in the built environment because of the impacts of COVID and the realization that things need, need to change and how do we interact in our environments. Uh, we really need to expand our definition of how we define the workforce of the future. What does, that, what does that really look like and mean? That really means that everyone needs to have some focus on sustainability and the work that they do. And we need to think long-term about adaptation and resilience. Brian mentioned this at the beginning and you know, this is about adaptation right now as a species. You know, the, the planet is going to be fine to a certain degree, uh, but we need to adapt and we need to figure out how we're going to be resilient uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Um, and so I just want to encourage you to kind of leverage the, the green building community. Again, coming back to the work we do, it's very intersectional, um, whether it's LEED or other certifications. Next slide, please. Uh, there's actually like a structured approach to looking at these things and looking at, you know, how do we how do we evaluate everything from um, not just the emissions in our building, but the health of our people in those spaces uh, here in California. And this is probably needs to be updated now that we're in a new year. Uh, but we have you know over 30,000 LEED certified professionals. We have over 80 million square feet of LEED certified buildings. There's a whole framework there. And there's not just LEED. There's well, there's Envision, you know, the Living Building Challenge. Uh, I actually always say, people are surprised when I say this, I, I don't really care if you use a certification or no certification at all, as long as you're doing the good work uh, in, your, in your buildings. Uh, but it's about having a structured approach to how we're making progress as a society. Next slide, please. Uh, and buildings matter. You know, here in LA, uh, buildings account for about 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions. You can see this graph here for, for California, uh, especially when you think about a lot of our industry is happening in buildings and transportation uh, is actually usually people moving between buildings. Buildings sort of play this pivotal role of, of how we connect everything. Uh, next slide, please. And so right now, electrification has been a, a major focus for our communities. Um, you know, is it the only one that we should be focused on? No, the reality is this needs to be all hands on deck with where we're at here in this critical decade of climate change. And if you look just at multifamily buildings here in LA, I just want to stress that the opportunity for electrification, and that's really looking at water heating, space heating, cooking, and clothes drying, it allow us, if you look at the middle graph here, to reduce our emissions and our energy use by 40%, emissions by 85%. And if we do all electric and go high efficiency in the sector of buildings, we're talking about a 61% energy reduction and a 90% emissions reduction. So this is something that we can do in the near term. Does this mean that we shouldn't be looking at RNG or looking at hydrogen? No, we, we need every solution right now, uh, but we know how to execute on this. And so we need to really help make this happen in the near term. Next slide, please. Uh, and so I want to stress that this next decade of adoption is really critical for us here in California. Um, you know, if you look at this graph here, this is just to meet the goals that we've stated for ourselves. Uh, and in California, we use a lot more natural gas than actually they use in other communities around the country. Uh, and we actually, this decade here, we need to really convert a lot of that end use natural gas use to electric in order to just hit the climate goals that we have for ourselves. I, I sort of find it fascinating that we always set these things. We're like, oh, in the next decade, don't worry, we'll figure out this, this, this giant slope. I'm, I'm an econ major at undergrad. So we have this huge curve here. We'll, we'll figure that out. Well, the reality is we're already a couple of years into this decade and really need to ramp up our approach uh, to how we're advancing these things in, in our communities. And at the end of the day, this is really a, about health on some level. I want to stress that as well. Um, I think we've all taken this opportunity, hopefully in some ways from the pandemic, to, to be more aware of the environments that we're stuck in, including me in this room here. Uh, and, you know, how does that impact us on a day to day basis? How can we improve our productivity? Um, what kind of air are we breathing? And so this is the opportunity to really, really assess the environments we're in. So I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, later today, and, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh I love that phrase, uh, humanize our resistance. And it was brought to you by the Green Building Council guy. Uh, that, was, that was wonderful. I'm also uh, human. I'm also human, Brian. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they, yeah. De definitely reassuring. Uh, so let's turn it to Jonathan Parfrey, uh, another perspective uh, from uh, his work with community organizations. Jonathan. Well, thank you, Brian, and it's really a joy to be here. Whenever I'm on these webinars, I always try to sneak a peek on who's here and who I know. So I know that uh, Dr. Uh, Dick Jackson is listening in. So 
I think we have to do a tip of the hat to Dr. Jackson, who's been such a tremendous leader protecting the health of Americans, whether it has to do with environmental contaminants or now with climate change. Uh, what a tremendous leader. And I'm just grateful you're on, Dick. It's, it's nice to see your name. And we also have Aaron Coots, who's with uh, the uh, LARC organization, the regional collaborative here in Southern California. And Lori Ann, uh, who's with SCAG, uh, the Southern California Association of Governments is on. And then our own Climate Resolve staff of Thelma and Gina. It's great to see you uh, dialing in. Um, when Sarah described Lendlease as, uh, as being old um, and said it was established way back in 1958, well, I was established in 1958. So I assume that that also uh, makes me old. But I wanna take you back even further than 1958 uh, and I'm going to constrain my comments mainly to extreme heat, but also touching on a wildfire smoke. Um, when we think of pre-industrial times, pre-conquest, before roads were built, before buildings were massively created, when populations were significantly less, um, the solar reflectance of planet Earth at that time uh, according to the preeminent scientist in the field of solar forcing, fellow by the name of Hashem Akbari, uh, he says it's around a third of the solar radiation was reflected back into space. And so in, in specific technical terms, that would be 0.33 SR, solar reflectance. And now when we've built our cities, the way we've built them is that they're now under 0.1. We reflect less than 10% back into space, contributing to what is called the urban heat island effect. But in addition to that, it is a contributor to climate change because the way we've constructed our cities, we're retaining that solar energy rather than reflecting it back into space. And so I want to take you back to uh, pre-conquest uh, San Fernando Valley. And the first accounts of the Franciscans when they would travel from the uh, San Buenaventura mission to the mission San Fernando, their accounts were that they were under the shade of oak trees for the entire way. Now I want you to ponder on that right now because when we see the old photographs of the San Fernando Valley, we see these kind of vast grass plains that's actually not the way LA used to be. Uh, those grass plains are there because we cut down the oak trees for construction. And so it takes about, oh, for an oak tree, maybe 30, 40, 50 years to really become a shade tree. And for other trees, it might take a little bit less, but it takes trees a, a good long time uh, to grow uh, back. But so over the past 150 years in our uh, industrialized society, we've dramatically changed uh, the way that we do these cities. And the predominant uh, uh, chemical that we have put into our society uh, has been fossil fuel. Uh, and not only does it come out of a tailpipe, but when we dig up crude oil and we send it to a refinery, the last thing that comes out after you've drawn out every possible uh, thing that can be combust combusted, the thing that's left over is asphalt. Asphalt is the detritus of the petroleum refining process. And that is what we have put predominantly in our cities, whether it's streets that are laden with asphalt or it's roofing shingles that are laid down with asphalt. And asphalt, you should know, has a solar reflectance value of under 0.1. So it's highly absorptive of solar radiation as well. And so I did a thought experiment a little while ago that said, what if we did both cool pavements and cool roofs uh, more broadly across California? So let's start with pavement. Let's start with streets. So California has approximately 400 million lane miles of maintained roadways. 
And this is statistics from Caltrans. And of course, the vast majority is covered in black asphalt. And then if we put a cooling slurry on top of that 5%, or excuse me, let me correct myself, 0.5%, half of 1% of those 400 million lane miles, that would be 100 and, uh, well, it came out to around $400 billion to be able to cover half of 1% of the, um, of the streets. And if we did cool roofs, cool roofs, we have 12 million homes in California. And again, most of our state is composed of asphalt shingles that absorb the sun's energy. And that energy then goes into homes, makes us use more electricity to cool down those homes. But instead, if we replace those shingles with cool roofs, that um, let's say we did half of the homes in California, the price tag for that would be around uh, $90 billion. Now, I think that's a lot of money. And it means that we have a huge commitment ahead of ourselves in order to change the geoengineering experiment that we've been doing the last 150 years. Uh, we need to be more in balance with nature by having more reflective material. One of the benefits, co-benefits of cool roofs and cool streets, which also entails cool parking lots, cool playgrounds. We've been doing some of those projects and I'd love to tell you about them in the Q&A at some point, is that they also entail solar for forcing where sunlight bounces back into space and it then reduces greenhouse gas emissions at its very core. And we think that that's really exciting. And when you're dealing with trees, they take 20 or 30 years. We love trees. We work on planting trees. However, the problem with that is that sometimes you get a drought and you get these diseases that are now attacking uh, our trees. And that doesn't mean that we should give up. We should find a way to take advantage of ways to cool down our cities today. So what do we do today uh, when it comes to heat waves? Well, let's just take a bus shelter. You've seen a lot of these bus shelters out there right now. They're totally inadequate. They do not provide the shading, but more importantly, the bus shelters today uh, don't provide an opportunity for hydration. Uh, drinking fountains, or hydration stations, as they're now called. Uh, our organization is working on one hydration station at one bus shelter in the San Fernando Valley. And it's taken a couple of years to work with the principals involved to get that thing off the ground. Another huge thing when it comes to heat waves today, you have to deal with this in the social terms, and it is to have uh, resilience hubs. Uh, I have the pleasure of working with Ben and, at, and USGBC and the Boyle Heights Arts Conservatory, City of LA, DWP, American Red Cross, to uh, help this one community-based organization become a microgrid. So it's resilient during um, you know, outages and resilient during wildfire where there's smoke everywhere. The public can go to a place where they will be taken care of and protected and the electricity will not go out. They can recharge their cell phones and be in touch with loved ones. We think this is a model for uh, an, a vast improvement on cooling centers. The one slide I wish I shared with you was ones I've taken of cooling centers and no one's ever in them. They're wonderful PSAs that go out over the airwaves, but no one ever goes. And so it makes us feel good to announce cooling centers, but they are never frequented. Another social uh, manifestation is labor. And what do we do about workers? And another person on this call is Mariana Estrada, who's now a graduate student at UCLA. She used to work at, at Climate Resolve and she worked in an Amazon warehouse in Riverside County. And there was no air conditioning where Mariana worked. Uh, there was, you know what has air conditioning? It's when Amazon imports electronic equipment, that gets refrigerated. But the people moving the electronic equipment doesn't get 
uh, air condition. Um, so um, did I say evacuate? No, I meant to say air conditioned, excuse me. So into the chilled rooms. So there's a ton of roof space on top of these warehouses and distribution centers. We should use that for photovoltaics that operate AC uh, underneath them. And last but not least, there are things that we can do about this through uh, state law. The, the recent budget has allocated well over a billion dollars on uh, resilience in California over the next three years. There's funds in there for resilience hubs, 100 million at least. Uh, there's funds in there for dealing with extreme heat. Um, and we have very discreet ideas on how that might work. But we have to watch people carefully. The California Natural Resources Agency uh, just put out guidelines for its $250 million on extreme heat. But less than 10% of any proposal that comes in actually has to deal with extreme heat. You almost can submit a proposal to, under the category of dealing with extreme heat that has nothing to do with extreme heat. And so we have to watch the bird dog, the agencies very closely to ensure that they do the right thing. And last but not least, it, I would be remiss if I did not include the legislation that our organization is currently working on, which is Assembly Bill 2076. And we call it 2076 because that's the year we're finally going to get our act together on climate change. I'm joking. And the, uh, the goal of this legislation is to have deep coordination at the state of California on extreme heat. And I hope you will read the legislation and uh, weigh in with your legislators to make it even better. Uh, thanks very much, Brian. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so uh, obviously we all have you know, some role to play. You know, the panelists have talked about the construction industry, transportation systems, public health, logistics industry, energy sector, city planners, food production systems. Uh, so how, how do we elevate and accelerate innovation? Uh, and I'm particularly interested, maybe Sarah, you can tackle this. Uh, how, how do you bring uh, the voices of your, your tenants, especially residential tenants, uh, to, to the fore and try and, and tap their not, you know, knowledge and their local you know, expertise about innovation? Yeah, this is an excellent question. Uh, residents aren't often used to being asked um, how they feel about, about innovation. And so when you create that dialogue, um, uh, you, it's amazing what you can get out of it. Am I frozen? No, you're fine. Okay, good. Uh, I look frozen to myself, but that's okay. Um, so I, I, I feel like I see this most often in our military communities um, where we have uh, uh, large social support um, systems and uh, base. And then we, we, and then the great thing about military communities is because people are often, you know, moving from one to the other. Um, there's a, there's a system for bringing people in the fold, figuring out what knowledge, figuring out what they've figured out. And then, and then, um, and then, and then applying that. Um, a good example of this is um, we're in the process of uh, uh, implementing the Fitwell community um, uh, system for our military communities, um, which is really exciting. And one of the things that's it's shown us is, for example, um, where uh, certain communities have done really well with flood. You know, we we have a lot of military communities that have recently been um, exposed to to flood. You know, in Tennessee and Fort Knox and Fort. Um, and uh, uh, others in Fort Campbell. Um, and so we've been able to use knowledge, um, local knowledge, okay, here's how Tennessee deals with flood and, and, and go from one to the other and the residents um, are able to know that. So, you know, we love, we love uh, collaborating with our residents um, very, very much uh, as we figure out climate change. And you're, and you're right, I think a lot of it is that the solutions are really, really local. You know, what works in Boston doesn't always work in New York. Um, and so we've had to, um, you know, make sure that we're really, really listening. Uh, ben, how, how can organizations like the Green Building Council, uh, organizations that serve similar functions, uh, help you know, share these uh, ideas, disseminate the practices, but also tailor them to local conditions? It's a, it's a great question. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big believer in relationships at the end of the day. And um, I put this in the chat, but we have a program 
called the the Net Zero Accelerator that we started about three years ago here in LA. And really because we wanted to create an innovation community around buildings and real estate in the LA area, you know, we kind of surveyed the, the US market and there was only one other innovation community really in the US and that was in New York because they have a pretty close knit uh, real estate ownership community. Uh, and so, you know, how can we do that? Well, we need to build more relationships and tell better stories about technology and buildings. Uh, one of the big things we focus on is that storytelling and may not be a surprise to you, but uh, it's hard to tell exciting, engaging stories sometimes about technology and buildings because we actually have a lot of the solutions today that could work, uh, but it's really about getting those positioned the right way, making sure they're cost effective, making sure we have uh, effective policy in place. You know, there's, there's so many hurdles uh, to jump through around permitting, around getting approval from local agencies for different kinds of technology. Uh, there's a question in the chat around concrete, for instance. Well, you know, you have to get, you know, approval from all these different agencies to certify concrete can be used in, you know, roadways or in buildings for different types of uses. And that's important, but that process could take five to 10 years, right? We don't, we don't have five to 10 years. So we need to look at how we can be innovative in addressing some of those policy concerns, but really also forming those relationships between great people like Sarah, who are working on buildings with companies that can really deliver solutions for her. And she needs to be honest with them about, hey, they need to be cost effective. And I only have this much capital to spend and you need to figure out how to make this work because that's that's where the innovation happens. Um, but we have a lot of the solutions today. And I want to encourage people to, to, to embrace those that are out there and just figure out how to make them work. We don't necessarily need new things all the time. Right? Okay. Okay. Uh Thanks, Ben. Uh, and I'd like to encourage the audience members to put their questions uh, in the question and answer chat. Uh, we'll dis start discussing some of those audience questions in just a sec, uh, but I'd like to give Jonathan Parfrey a chance to weigh in on you know, the, the, the push and pull, but you know, what are uh, the uh, accelerants, you know, so to speak, uh, of innovation and what are the barriers? Thanks, Brian. Um, I neglected to mention that there are some good news that we can actually maybe pat ourselves on the back a little bit. Uh, not all is doom and gloom. So for example, uh, our organization worked with building and safety in the city of LA, and we changed the building code for Los Angeles together. Uh, it was a joint exercise involving the public as well. And we involved a lot of the, the roofing community so that they could weigh in. So in 2013, we were able to change the roofing code to increase and set a target for all new um, rooftop uh, shingles, residential shingles, steep slope shingles in Los Angeles. And we got it to 0.2. <laughs> and really, we need to get to 0.33, as I mentioned before, but that'll be in the future. It's an incremental process. But I'm happy to report that now there's over 60,000 roofs in the greater LA area that have now have cooler roofs than they had before. So things can happen, uh, but we do need to keep track of the uh, technology as it improves, as we're able to get more reflective materials out into the world, uh, we're able to get them deployed successfully, uh, but but there is some movement and I find that very encouraging. So uh, one of our audience members, Aaron Coots, asked a, a question that uh, I'd like to ask all of the panelists and whoever wants to weigh in first can, can do so uh, about private sector. How do we push innovation out to the, the private sector? And I'll, I'll focus it, uh, on specifically around residential housing. Uh, the folks who, the landlords who own, you know, multifamily dwellings, whether, whether those are rental or, or lease, uh, existing structures. Yeah, we, we see a lot of innovation with new structures, but what can we do with the enormous housing stock that we already have out there, especially housing stock that is not the single family home? Any. Yeah, I have a lot of feelings on this subject. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, I mean, frankly, the easiest way to make it 
make the private sector adopt it is to make it cost effective. You know, I would do an all electric to a mixed field all electric retrofit uh, now if it was commercially viable. It's not currently, even in places where it is an extreme cold. Um, it's hard to rip out of that equipment. So the more that and and things become commercially viable, um, not always by accident or through market forces. You know, there are incentives, programs, subsidies um, that make things a lot more attractive. So what we sort of expect is that, yes, the investment, by the way, has has woken up to all of this. Like they've been, they were radio silent in the first years of my career. I felt like I wrote sustainability reports and threw them into an abyss. That is not the case anymore. Um, our JV partners, our equity partners, I mean, the whole entire capital stack, green bonds is all is all engaged. So there's a lot of pressure now uh, for private companies to get going on ESG. Um, so that's that's all there. You know, more you know building performance regulation, which is a little weird for housing, is good. Um, and then also make it so that it makes sense to do it. Um, you know, incentivizing the the technologies, the uh, materials they'll get us to a lower carbon future is, is really, I think the other piece of it. Um, and once those things are viable, you see adoption. Um, so it's, it's not particularly a mystery how, how it happens. Those are who are forward thinking will do things when it doesn't make it always a ton of commercial sense. Um, and then those who are less forward thinking will do it whenever it's viable. We see that with solar, right? Lots of people in Los Angeles who have solar do, are not really people who care a ton about climate change, but when solar became cost-effective and there were the right financial models to do it, solar took off, um, you know, it needs to be like that for everything. Yeah, in my own research, I've seen, uh, I've been reviewing uh, strategies of what they call the C40 cities. Those are cities yeah. around the globe who are the leading innovators. And uh, at, at city level, climate mitigation, climate adaptation. And when you look at the leaders of the leaders, their focus is on funding, changing the playing field to make it economically vi viable to innovate and to innovate quickly. Uh, anyone have the, Ben, Jonathan, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this because because like Sarah, I'm, I'm a bit of a green building nerd and I couldn't agree more that we need to focus more on retrofitting our existing buildings. Um, you know, 99% of the buildings we, we have now are the ones we're, we're still going to have, you know, 10 years from now. And I think we focus too much on the newer buildings. So um, Sir is exactly right. A lot of it is really around the financial models. I mean, if you think about, we, we have all these structures that don't really fit with each other. And multifamily buildings are a great example. You know, we have owners of buildings who have tenants that aren't willing to invest in their space because they aren't, you know, they may be on an annual lease. Uh, and in a lot of cases here in LA, those owners pay for water use, but not electricity. And tenants don't care about the water use because they're not paying for it and they have no information about how much water they're really using. So we have all these mismatched structures and we need to figure out how we cut through that noise quite a bit. Electrification is one example where there's no question that long-term it reduces long-term operating costs. It's much more efficient, but how do we tackle that upfront cost? Well, we need to figure out that financing mechanism that's gonna unlock that market. And we also need to figure out how we give people that information at their fingertips you know, LA is a bit behind smart metering in terms of where other cities are at. We need to have similar thing around water where people can get real time information about, you know, what their water use is, what the electricity use is. You know, I think if you ask most people, they have no idea about what's really happening in their home and how that's impacting their energy or water use. So to, to put the pressure on them to say, hey, you need to reduce that. Well, I, I, don't, I don't really know on, a, on an hour to hour basis, you know, if I took the shower, if there's a if there's a leak, what's really affecting my water use? What's affecting my energy use? So a lot of this is about information and fixing those structures. And those are big, complicated systems. So I think we need to focus on how do we simplify things, especially from an equity standpoint in our communities of need and focus on how can we invest now to reduce the next 20, 30, 40 years of operating costs in the face of, of climate change. Jonathan? Well, what comes to my mind on costs is uh, some of the uh, new housing that we need to create here in Southern California. I'm sure you're aware that there are the RENA numbers for Los Angeles County says that we need 300,000 new units by the year 2029. And our friends from SCAG could probably tell us the whole SCAG region, which I think is significantly larger of the housing units we're supposed to have here in Southern California. So we have a housing crisis. We have an affordability crisis. We have an equity and social justice crisis. And we have a climate crisis. 
are there ways in which we can approach all of these at the same time? And my, it's, it's hard because we also have a NIMBY crisis too. <laughs> and so the trying to do infill, trying to gain greater density inside our cities and, and getting that past people who are holding on to the old Los Angeles and not ready to relinquish that vision is very, very hard. Uh, our organization is working with a company called Five Point. Uh, they're, they're doing a rather large development in Valencia and we're helping them reach their net zero targets. Uh, and we have been doing uh, really great mitigation projects right here in Los Angeles County, uh, working with grid alternatives, putting cool roofs on top of homes, then putting PV on top of those homes to reduce their GHG usage, and then working with the Climate Action Reserve to quantify and provide the specific credits that are required by LA County for this project. I think it's pretty innovative, but again, that's on uh, virgin land. And what do you do about infill? And I think part of the problem, frankly, it's been the activists. We have failed in our job of convincing the public of the necessity for a new vision of Los Angeles where it is much more public transportation and active transportation and telecommunications uh, developed than it is by getting in your car and going places. Because right now that's our current model. It's get in the car and go. And that is the, one of the largest drivers of GHG in, in, in the state, in the country, in the world, is that model of getting in your car and going places. So we have to find another way and uh, I think we have to do a better job of convincing people of the benefits of rubbing shoulders with the, the people that you share a city with. And this now bumps into the problem of the homelessness problem. And, and so sometimes we find these intersectional uh, uh, quagmires that we're in because we haven't addressed something in one area Regaining that sense of a wonderful public space is hard to argue when we have so many people who have been abandoned and left on our streets. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, so I think we can squeeze in a little bit of time for one more question. Uh, this one's from David Reed. Apologies to everyone else who posted questions that we didn't get to. Um, but this, this one uh, is near and dear. And so I'll take my prerogative and get uh, to equity. Uh, so David Reed uh, was asking about equity. I, I posited that uh, equity, especially health equity, is a good thing to lead with. It can uh, help accelerate action, uh, but it presents you know, obstacles too. Uh, and my, my response, it, it's, there's a, a political answer and a technical answer, but they, the, the the political one is we need to get more different kinds of stakeholders involved. The technical one uh, response is we need to do a better job of measuring what are the potential benefits of action uh, and action soon. Uh, both of those, uh, their, their overlap is co-benefits. We need to find uh, and highlight, raise up the co-benefits, co-benefits for climate adaptation, climate uh, mitigation, health, um, economic sustainability. And uh, th those are, are out there. And I think in the work of the organizations that our, our panelists represent, uh, there, there, there are many of those co-benefits. We probably need to do a better job of highlighting them and, and telling the story of these win-win opportunities. Does anyone else want to take uh, a few seconds and weigh in on that? I, I mean, I, I just would start by saying that I think for so many years, we sort of shot ourselves in the foot in, the, in this space by not leading with the, the health benefits and the long-term ROI benefits and that you know, the models are really flawed right now where we're not taking into account occupant health uh, and we're not taking into account the impacts of climate change or even just simply looking at how productivity for people increases when they're in healthier spaces. And so we do need to shift those, those models 
Uh, and I, I think when we look at, at, at equity in our buildings, we have a, a massive challenge ahead of us, you know, as we continue to see the impacts of climate change, that's only being exasperated by those who are living in uh, less well-constructed buildings with less well-maintained systems. Uh, and so, you know, this is really the big challenge. And as we look at, you know, whether it's finan financing mechanisms, as, as Sarah mentioned, or look at, you know, as we're building new housing, as Jonathan mentioned, um, we need to make sure equity is, is first in how we position these things going forward, because for too long it, it hasn't been. We can, we're continuing to see now that, that, exasperation of the, of the difference in society between the haves and the have nots in the, in the face of climate change. So there are no easy solutions though, I think as, as Jonathan pointed out, but everything is intersectional. So I think even just by focusing on, on one or two things that can have bigger impacts, uh, we can see the results of that long, long term. And I'll just say we have an affordable component in all of the residential we build and it makes financial sense in addition because you can recognize revenue earlier and whatnot and sometimes you get the land for cheaper and it goes right into the pro forma. So sometimes there are simpler solutions. Again, if you can get incentives lined correctly, developers will build more affordable housing as an example. That is also green and, you know, cool roofs as we're hearing and all the good stuff. Okay, I'm going to have to close it out at that. Thank you. Um, and I, you know, we have uh, a number of links post posted in the chat. Check those out. Check out the websites uh, of Climate Resolve, the Green Building Council, Lend Lease, uh, and, and everyone that they work with. There's each one of these panelists re represents a massive network of climate interests. Uh, really exciting work. Um, so check that out. Tim, did you want to make any closing yeah, just, comment? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to thank everybody. What a stimulating conversation. Very interesting, very informative. So thanks, everybody. Um, this does conclude the program. I want to thank the audience for joining us. I, of course, want to thank all the great panelists. Uh, thank Brian. Uh, and as a reminder, the concluding seminar uh, will be held sometime in May. We're planning it now. And we'll focus on managed retreat, displacement, and mitigation caused by climate change. Uh, so look out for that. And um, with that, I wish you a, a great remainder of your day. And, um, you know, this was really terrific. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.